Good evening and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. This series is made possible thanks to a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dick Deming, our founder, who is going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Deming. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about tonight's program. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Bartlett Hacken Miller will be presenting. And we met uh, a couple years ago, and, and Suzanne is uh, Dr. Uh, Bartlett Hacken Miller has given uh, several talks to our group, uh, most notably about forest bathing. bathing. But uh, we've asked her to, uh, to cover a different topic tonight. Um, she grew up in Cedar Falls, went to uh, um, Cedar Falls for high school at the University Associated High School there, and then went to UNI for her undergrad in biology, got her medical degree at the University of Iowa, and then her OBGYN residency in Pittsburgh, and uh, practiced OBGYN for many years. Always had an interest in integrative medicine, sort of the mind, body, spirit approach. And uh, recently got her integrative medicine degree at the University of Arizona with Dr. Weil. And uh, is interested in lots of things that make us healthier and increase our wellness. And one of the things that is really important, we talk a lot about exercise and we probably don't talk as much about sleep as we should. And sleep is just really important to health and actually a wellness and preventing cancer. So tonight we've asked uh, Dr. Bartlett Hackenmiller to talk about the integrative approach to sleep. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bartlett Hackenmiller. All right, thanks. Just call me Suzanne, by the way. Even my patients have to call me Suzanne. They're great. All right, so here I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see if this works. Hmm. Did that work? That did not work, did it? It did. We do see your screen. There we go. We can see, see your there mouse. We go. <laughs> it looks good. How's that? All right, that looks like integrative approaches to sleep. Is it showing up right? It is. It's we're we're seeing the uh, two view as opposed to just the slideshow view, but it's. Uh, we practiced this yesterday, and it was gonna work. Let's see. So we're seeing your current mm -hmm. slide and the next slide. Okay, so let's go back. Hang on a second here. Don't we love, 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 there we go. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Yep, now we see the single slide. Oh, I have no idea what happened <laughs> that made that different, but great. All right, well, here, I just added this slide. <laughs> so um this this really just exemplifies i think today this moment in history and i i don't know if anybody else is feeling this sentiment today but this is how i feel after the news that hit today um and so it made me think a lot about sleep and the fact that we just have so much stress i don't know about you what do you think dr dummy yeah, I think um, there's this uh, thinly veiled stress that, that probably has no veil on it after today. Yeah, definitely. So anyway, I'll, I'll move on. But, you know, so I was just going to give a little kind of, we have this whole PowerPoint that we are going to use loosely. We talked about this just a few minutes ago, Dr. Deming and I, that um, we really want to have more of a conversation for you all about sleep today instead of uh, going through this PowerPoint. We don't want to put you to sleep with the PowerPoint presentation, although that if that's your goal, it could end up working really well for everybody. <laughs> Uh, but, but really, sleep is just this highly complex state, and it, it's so important, and I don't think that we, we give it the importance that we should in medicine. I don't, like, how often does your doctor ever ask you how your sleep is? Probably not as often as 
as they should. But we know that sleep is so important for all these different functions in the body, especially for the brain, as far as uh, solidifying memories and processing emotions. And research is emerging, finding how important sleep is for nearly every function in the body and nearly every organ system in the body. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. I wanted to talk today then about some of the prevalent, how prevalent some sleep disorders are, how important restorative sleep is, um, some consequences of sleep disruption, and then some things that we can do for improved sleep, ranging from conventional treatment and really talking about some of the drawbacks of conventional treatment, and then looking more at some integrative approaches, a little bit more natural ways of treating sleep problems. So, I don't know, look at this. I, I think it would be crazy today to not mention this, this COVID, this pandemic that we're experiencing globally. And so um, it's interesting to me that way back in February when the pandemic was just starting, some researchers had the foresight to investigate the effect that the, you know, the pandemic, the epidemic at that time was having on people's stress and sleep and all of that. And they found that in a study that they did uh, a questionnaire back in February that 20% of people were already reporting sleep problems as a result of the stress of the pandemic. And then these other things, acute stress, anxiety, depression. And so I can only imagine that that has continued to worsen over the the ensuing months because it is just kind of this, this stress that seems to be hanging over us. And feel free to hop in, Dr. Deming, if you have any thoughts or comments. Yeah, no, I, 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 um, I don't know if you're going to get to any data that correlates uh, lack of sleep with um, other physical illnesses, but I certainly am. have seen studies uh, related to even mm -hmm. cancer. Uh, yeah. Um, prevalence. I'm going to mention some of that. So yes. Yeah. So, um, and two thirds of people of adults just don't get to the recommended eight hours of sleep. Um, and I think, you know, we'll talk in a second about this eight hours of sleep. That's the amount of sleep we're supposed to be getting. And I hear all the time, well, I don't need eight hours of sleep. Um, but look at this. It turns out there actually is a gene that determines whether we can get less than eight hours of sleep. But uh, people who don't have this gene, let me see here, um, this DEC2 gene, uh, people, I'm sorry, people who do have this gene can actually get by with less than five hours of sleep, but the prevalence of that gene is less than 1% of the population. And so your chances are actually greater of getting hit by lightning than they are of having this gene that allows you to get less than five hours of sleep and be okay with that. So, so all you people out there who say, I don't actually need eight hours of sleep. I do fine on five hours of sleep. You probably don't. So chances are you probably don't have this gene and you probably really do need more sleep. <laughs> Um, and, and people will often say to me, well, I, I sleep great. In fact, I fall asleep the minute I hit the pillow, I hit the pillow and I'm out. Um, and I, you know, or I'm drowsy all day. And those are all signs of a sleep problem. In fact, so if you're one of those people who hits the pillow and you're out, that is indicative of either having severe sleep de deprivation or possibly even having a sleep disorder. So, so I'm kind of dispelling a few little myths here, but um, I hear these things all the time. Oh, I don't need that much sleep. And also I hit the pillow and I'm out. But that might not be so good. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of, importance of restorative sleep. And we know that having good sleep has implications in terms of accidents, car accidents, accidents at work, uh, if you don't get enough sleep and rest, um, concentration, of course, and performance at school and work. And then as Dr. Deming just alluded to a minute ago, the increased risk of disease. And I'm not going to go into all of these because it would take us all evening to talk about all of these different um, risks. Uh, types of disease that can be increased with, with loss of sleep. Um, but I will talk a little bit about how cancer is affected by lack of sleep. But look at this. So cardiovascular disease, cancers, metabolic disorders, autoimmune conditions, even infections, obesity, chronic inflammation. There was a study that found that uh, your 
flu shot more likely to be inactive if you don't get eight hours of sleep. So isn't that something? Often we'll say, oh, I didn't bother to get the flu shot, it doesn't work for me or whatever. Uh, a study found that, if, that people who were not getting eight hours of sleep had less effective flu vaccines. And I think that's pertinent when we're thinking about getting COVID vaccines. We need, we need good sleep for our bodies to work well, to be able to mount the immune response that we want to help the vaccine work for us. You're right. So, you know, we, we are aware of some states of our health, um, but we're not able to consciously be aware of other states of our health. For example, our immune system, how it's right. working it isn't something that we uh, can feel like our heart rate um, or our breathing rate, but it, it just makes a lot of sense that anything that affects our state of well-being is going to affect the immune system as well. Right. Definitely. That's a really good point. Yeah, so when we think about what can happen if we don't get enough sleep, this is uh, in reference to cancer. Um, one study found that a single night of just getting four hours of sleep wiped out 70% of the natural killer cells circulating in our body. That, and these natural killer cells, there's a picture there. I don't know if, you know if you can see my cursor, but this guy, can you see my cursor? Um, this is a natural killer cell, and these are cells that we have in our immune system whose job it is to sweep through the bloodstream and find things that don't belong there, things like viruses and bacteria and even cancer cells. I often tell my patients um, that as we're going through every day, our bodies are creating new cells that are replicating and dividing. Some of those cells are perfect, some are not perfect. It's those imperfect cells that if they go unchecked and they're not caught by things like the natural killer cells, that those, those abnormal cells will continue replicating and dividing and ultimately become a cancer cell or a tumor. So it's really important that these natural killer cells are functioning properly so they can do their job and whisk around the body and find cancer cells. So isn't that something that just one night of lack of sleep impairs your natural killer cell function? Wow. Um, and then there was another, another study. This was a really large study um, in 2012 in Europe that looked at 25,000 people. And they found that sleeping less than six hours was associated with a 40% increased risk of developing cancer as opposed to those who were receiving more than seven hours per night. So uh, these, again, these are associations they're seeing. We always want to say that more studies are needed, more research is always needed to follow up on these things and figure out what the associations mean. But um, it's something that's so simple. It's a simple intervention to work on improving sleep. And if it can help to prevent cancer, to prevent um, heart disease, to help our immune system, why not see what we can do to maximize it? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts or questions or comments before I move on? Yeah, so I would say, you know, most of us probably intuitively think of brain of the brain and think of sleep as some sort of a of a storing of memories and resetting of the brain, but um, we can't lose sight of the fact that our body is totally interconnected. And even though we may not understand exactly how our brain is connected to our immune system, mm -hmm. that there is a lot of reparative work that happens during sleep. And it's not so simple as to uh, store memories and, and, uh, and uh, elucidate dreams that a lot of repair of other aspects of our body and our immune system is just part of our, our entire ecosystem of a body is affected by the loss of that restorative power of sleep. Yeah, I, that is so true. And I constantly say, you know, we are complex beings. And I think in medicine, we're, we have to get away from this notion that we're just aggregates of organ systems, yes. organs and organ systems, and that we can just treat one symptom or one organ and not realize that that has implications on every other organ system in the body and that everything is inextricably linked, as you said. Uh, yep. 
All right, so I'll move on here. So I thought we would talk a little bit about causes of insomnia, things that keep us from sleeping. And these lists maybe are things that people have seen. So I'll just quickly run through this. But um, a lot of people have problems with reflux, gastroesophageal reflux or GERD, heartburn type of things, and that can keep you awake. Restless leg syndrome, I see a lot of patients with that. <clears throat> Chronic pain, of course, can be a problem. And then things that we do, things that we give ourselves, caffeine, alcohol, even prescription medications, and even over-the-counter medications can contribute to poor sleep. And of course, things like shift work, being um, working nights, trying to sleep during the day, all of those things can play havoc with our sleep. You know, one thing um, I wanna ask your opinion of this. Uh, um, I have a sense of certain foods I eat, and I'm not talking about the effect of uh, reflux, but that certain foods tend to make me a little bit buzzed. Now, obviously, yeah. caffeine is, is a food product, mm -hmm. and um, are you aware of any other particular foods that you would identify by name? So, I uh, yeah, don't want to get too personal, yeah. but for me, eating raw onions tends to uh, interfere with my sleep, not hmm. because of any reflux. Right. And I'm, I've always kind of wondered whether there was some, um, some uh, particular chemical in certain foods that acts like a caffeine. Well, I think there probably are all kinds of things that could be going on. And <clears throat> I'll mention a couple of herbal remedies towards the end here. Um, but if you think about plants, we, there are so many medicinal properties of plants that we have not even begun to understood, understand. Um, and so we do know that so many different plants have properties that either cause us to be awake or cause us to help sleep. And I'll talk about a few of those, but, but sure, um, there may be a chemical in onions that does contribute to that. Off the top of my head, I'm not aware of of that, but but absolutely, it goes back to being complex beings and Plants are complex beings as well. And um, I have studied herbal medicine. And one of the things that I was taught by my teacher is that we co-evolved with plants and our body has receptors that, that perfectly match chemicals found in plants. And so we haven't even begun to understand what all of those properties are. So something like onions keeping you awake, maybe something other people have experienced and maybe something specific to your system, who knows? But, but absolutely, I think uh, getting to know our own bodies, our own systems and what causes var various effects is, is so important. And the people who are in tune with those things are much healthier in general, just because they're, they're tapped into what's going on in their body. So yeah, we'll move on here a little bit. I don't wanna belabor caffeine and how it works. Um, I did mention to Dr. Deming that uh, if any of the people in the support group are interested in these actual slides, I'm happy to share them. Um, I don't wanna really get into all of this, but uh, one thing I'll comment on is people are often unaware that caffeine has a half-life of up to eight hours. So if you consume something with caffeine, coffee, soda, um, black tea, some of the energy drinks, even as late as, you know, early mid afternoon, that may be affecting you well into the evening or night, nighttime. So caffeine does stick around for a lot longer than people often realize. And I think, um, at least from my own experience, you can get away with some of these things when you're a kid. <laughs> Some of these things catch up to you later on in life where you can't tolerate that eight hour half-life of caffeine anymore. And I think sometimes people don't realize that it kind of creeps up on them. And I wanted to talk about alcohol because it is the most commonly used sleep aid. Um, and people will often say, well, if I drink alcohol, I'm out. And it's actually quite a misconception that alcohol is a sleep aid and it disrupts sleep more than it aids sleep. So it may help you to fall asleep, but alcohol has been found to disrupt REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep or the dream sleep that we know we really, really need, as well as deep sleep actually, uh, that we really need for all of these processes of the brain and immune function and all of those things. Um, so alcohol tends to maybe help you fall asleep, but it causes more awakenings during the night and definitely impairs the deep and REM sleep that we need. 
I can go on unless you have any thoughts on that. No, you know, I, I have heard what you've said. I think that uh, you explained it in a way that um, makes us understand why there's the misconception that it helps with sleep. Um, most of the time you, you notice you go to sleep faster, but um, it's not just a matter of quantity. And that's one of the difficult things about sleep. I mean, you can time how much time you spent in bed. That's an easy thing to time. How much time were you laying in bed? And your phone can probably chart how much time you were laying in bed without moving around a lot. Right. But um, I, I think a lot of us uh, who wake up in the middle of the night and think that we spend three or four hours then, um, <laughs> you know, how much, how much sleep do we really get and how do we quantify that? Um, the, the, the number of nights in a year that I go to bed and sleep all the way through and wake up, you know, eight hours later, just with that, rested feel I bet I can count those on one hand yeah um and it's more common that uh you know that I'm awake in the middle of the night for a number of hours and how do you factor that into how many nights how many hours <laughs> of sleep did you get right. right and I didn't mention I was sharing this with you before we got went live tonight but I personally have had really every sleep problem known to man. And so um, I am quite sleep obsessed. And I have found that when I really follow all of my own advice and am a good patient, that I, I can get eight hours of sleep and wake up feeling amazing. And that's kind of kind of monumental to me that that these things do work when we take the time to to make them a priority. Um, but yeah, I've worked with sleep experts for decades. So, so this is something that I really, really feel committed to personally trying to, to do better with. I didn't even mention, um, this is totally an aside, but um, they've, they've linked poor sleep with Alzheimer's disease too. And so when we're thinking about, gosh, what can we do to improve our quality of life and our longevity and things, honestly, sleep, improving sleep is one of the best things we could do for all of those different reasons. So I'll move on here talking about other things that can contribute to insomnia, sleep noise. We talk about these various factors that can inhibit, uh, inhibit sleep that are coming from either inside or outside of the body. So they can be inside the body, which might be a biological problem like reflux, as we mentioned before, or it could be a psychological pro uh, problem where you're just, you know, ruminating about the problems in your day or whatever, anxiety, stress, depression, all of those kinds of things. And then there are also environmental factors. So these would be external factors that can contribute to poor sleep. So something like your bed being uncomfortable comfortable, or to your room being too warm or somebody snoring or all of the different external kinds of things that could mess with your sleep. Um, so again, I kind of went through some of these, but external uh, noise also could be things like light, too much light. And this is something that actually is a really big problem in our country is increased light at night. And so anything we can do to just turn down the lights um, can help with sleep. And I've had patients over the years who I've gone through all of these different things that we could try. And uh, I will never forget one patient came back and said, you know what, I stopped. I stopped having the television on in, in the bedroom. Poof, I'm sleeping better. That was all it took. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the best recommendations I can make is, is not have the TV on, not have the devices on uh, at least 30 minutes before bed. I'm getting ahead of myself because I think I have that on a slide somewhere, but um, having your bedroom too warm, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then again, I already said these things, these internal noise types of things. All right, should we talk about some treatment ideas? Yes, I'm, okay. I'm all ears. All ears, I know. This is what people really wanna hear is how can I make it better? We don't have to talk about what the problem is, what should I do? 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, there are a lot of people in this country who use sleep aids. Um, that is one thing I refuse to do. So I will lie awake all night long before taking a pharmaceutical sleep aid um, and call me crazy, call me stubborn. But um, I, I just have a lot of concerns about prescription sleep aids. Uh, there was a large study of 4,500 people that found there actually was no difference in time to fall asleep between people taking some of the newer forms of sleep aids, such as Ambien, versus a placebo. So if that tells you anything, maybe it's, maybe it's in your mind that the sleep aid is helping. And we do know that they can cause some problems. Um, we do know also that a number of medications disrupt our REM sleep. And so the, all of the um, categories of medications on this slide, things from antidepressants, benzodiazepines, so that would be like your Valium, your uh, lorazepam or Ativan, um, your Ambien, antihypertensive medications and pain medicines even, all of these different categories of medications have been found to disrupt REM sleep. So again, it's that rapid eye movement sleep, that sleep that means you're dreaming. And I will often say to or ask patients if they're dreaming. And you don't necessarily have to tell me that you can remember everything about your dream, but often maybe you'll wake up and know that you were dreaming even if you can't remember the dream. If you can remember that you're dreaming, that is an excellent sign. It's an excellent sign that you're getting the quality of sleep that you need. If you tell me that you never dream, that you can't remember the last time you remembered a dream, uh, then that is a, a, that's a major concern. And one thing to look at would even be some of these pharmaceutical medications. And again, all of these different categories of medications can be culprits. And I'm not suggesting that someone go off of these medications without discussing it with their physician, of course, but just to be aware that they can be culprits in disrupting sleep. Um, let's see, this was a study uh, that looked at development of cancer um, in people who were taking sleeping pills. So, you know, this is not something that I say to scare people, uh, but this study did find that 30, that uh, people taking sleeping pills were 30 to 40% more likely to develop cancer than those who were not. Now, one of the possible limitations of this study is the question of, is it the poor health in, in the first place that caused the problem that led to cancer, or is it the taking of the sleeping pills that led to cancer. So I don't like to jump to conclusions about any study because there are always all kinds of potential confounding um, factors. And I think that always, like I said before, always more study, more research is needed before we can jump to conclusions. But it's something to think about. Yeah. And, and that's a good point because we already said that, you know, a sleep deprivation increased the risk of cancer. And you're obviously not going to take these medicines unless you know, you're, you're sleep right. deprived. So exactly. So take this with a grain of salt, but something to think about. So we'll move into this management of sleep noise. Um, and honestly, again, if I were to suggest the things that have the highest likelihood of being beneficial, these are not things that you have to take in pill or supplement or tablet form at all. These are just lifestyle changes that may have some of the greatest impact in improving sleep. And as I said, I've had patients who say, oh my gosh, I just did one of these things and lo and behold, my sleep is better. So things like mind-body practices, things like yoga, meditation, mindfulness practice, practices, guided imagery, there are so many options now uh, that are available in recordings. Isn't that right, Dr. Demi? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> My phone has at least three sleep apps. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. And you can just turn them on, maybe have uh, earbuds or whatever. Uh, so those can be very helpful. Developing a ritual before going to bed and just making sure you do that every night. When I do all of these things, like I said, I sleep like a baby. So that evening ritual means starting to turn down the lights at least a half hour to an hour before bedtime, uh, maybe taking a warm bath. Um, any kind of self-care types of practices, anything that kind of quiets the mind. Journaling is an excellent way to release some of the tensions and the stressors of the day and be able to just put them aside and move on. Um, you know, and, and when you mention uh, ritual, I mean, part of the ritual is also 
the time, like to go to bed at the same time. Oh my gosh, at the yeah. Same time. That's so some of the best things to do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and even on weekends, ugh. sleep experts do recommend that we try to stick to the same schedule even on weekends. So I wanted to mention cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, there, You can actually find cognitive behavioral therapy therapists who are trained to deal with insomnia, and there's a website here. Uh, but this idea of cognitive behavioral therapy, I did this one time, and it actually does work. But this idea that when you are lying in bed, you only get to lie there for 20 minutes. If you're not asleep in 20 minutes, and again, I will mention, supposedly, you're not supposed to be looking at your clock or your watch. <laughs> so this is a challenge. But if you feel like it's probably been about 20 minutes, um, the idea is you get up, you don't lie there, you get up, you go do something kind of brainless, kind of, I always suggest like folding towels and people will say, well, what if I don't have any towels? And I suggest dump out your towel drawer in your kitchen and fold them. Probably needs to be organized anyway. So something that doesn't take a lot of brain work, you can do in dim light, you don't have to think too much. Um, and then as soon as you yawn, the moment you yawn, you go back to bed. And this actually works. It's very hard to make yourself do it, but it actually works. And if you are awake for another 20 minutes, you're supposed to get up, and do the whole same thing all over again. So it works. All right, I'm gonna get my towels ready. <laughs> get some laundry ready, whatever it is. Something really boring, really just repetitive. You know, I've sat and read magazines trying to make this work. I've read an entire magazine cover to cover. So it does have to be something very boring. Towels. Um, some other things, ideas for body noise, avoiding eating heavy meals within three hours of bedtime. I definitely know that I sleep better. You mentioned foods, but in general, if I eat a heavy meal, I'm more likely to have sleep problems than if I have less of a uh, full stomach. Um, there are certain foods listed here, fatty foods, alcohol, caffeine, peppermint, things that especially trigger esophageal reflux. I know that anything tomato-y will do it to me, tomato sauce, sometimes dairy for some people. Um, exercise. Some people really enjoy exercising by, uh, before bedtime, but that can raise your core body temperature and inhibit your ability to go to sleep. Uh, this slide probably has some of the most helpful things on it. Um, again, so simple, but being sure that you're in a cool, dark, quiet, safe space is the number one key. One thing that can be very helpful is setting your thermostat if you have an automatic um, thermostat so that it gets colder in the middle of the night because studies have found that having a temperature below 68 degrees, some people even say 65 degrees, I'm not willing to go that cold, but 68 degrees at night very much can help with sleep. And so I personally can't fall asleep if it's too cold. So I like to have the temperature warmer when I go to bed and I don't want it to be freezing cold when I wake up, but there are so many um, of the um, programmable thermostats available now that you can set it so that at some time in the middle of the night, it goes down to 68 degrees. And then before you are set to wake up, start to raise the temperature again. Uh, there's, there's research looking at toxins in the environment, in our mattresses and our bedding and trying to think about uh, having mattresses and sheets that are free of these pesticides and chemicals and things like that. Um, a lot of people have allergies. So things like a HEPA fil filter can be helpful. Uh, and anything you can do to avoid the light. So even the tiniest little lights on things can be a problem. Uh, if you're a person who's on your computer at night, there is a free download you can get that's at f.lux.com that turns the monitor on your uh, computer to a bluish tint in the evening. I'm sorry, bluish in the morning and a pinkish tint in the evening. And that helps um, to prevent against suppressing melatonin and helps you to fall asleep. So free download. So we'll move along. A lot of times people want to talk about supplements that they could take to help them with sleep. So I wanted to talk about some of those and I have a quick disclosure and disclaimer and I do have some photos of some supplements here and I don't have any relationship with those companies. I don't specifically recommend uh, necessarily any companies over the other um, 
don't have any stock in companies. I also wanted to mention a disclaimer that anytime a patient is considering embarking on a supplement regimen, it's a good idea to discuss it with a physician. Granted, not all doctors have knowledge about dietary and herbal supplements, so finding somebody who does is a good idea. There are caveats related to pregnancy, breastfeeding children, cancer, which is pertinent to this group potentially, um, and especially during active cancer treatment and taking certain supplements. Liver and kidney disease are also potentially issues with any kind of supplement. So this is something I work with patients on to be sure that anything they want to be taking that is either a dietary or herbal supplement would be safe for whatever consideration they might have. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every, Any thoughts every, on that? Yep. Great, great point. And um, a couple of points you made that are really important. Number one, many doctors uh, trained um, in, in standard medical schools don't get a lot of education about supplements. And uh, some physicians are just going to be negative about it and, and will just sort of say, just stop taking everything okay. and others are going to be more um, open-minded and knowledgeable and actually tell you which ones you can take and which ones you can't take. Obviously that's a, a good sign mm -hmm. because um, uh, there are specific reasons why some supplements might interact adversely with uh, chemotherapy. In terms of radiation therapy, I, and I'm a radiation oncologist, I'm not an expert on supplements, but I'm inquisitive and, and read and educate myself. I'm not aware that any particular supplement has any adverse effect with radiation per se, but with uh, medical oncology, chemotherapy, drugs, uh, systemic treatments such as chemotherapy or hormone therapy or immunotherapy, there may be more um, interactions that are potential. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And we should have further conversation about that because uh, we talk a lot about antioxidants, you know, and, and, and often patients, especially if they're diagnosed with cancer, they hear about antioxidants. And I'm kind of going off script and a little bit off topic, actually. Uh, antioxidants are, are great at preventing cancer. However, many cancer treatments, um, chemotherapy and radiation, to my understanding, were, I'm not a radiation oncologist, work by oxidative damage. So trying to kill the cells by oxidative damage. So then the thought is, we wouldn't necessarily want to give too many antioxidants in supplement form while we're trying to cause oxidative damage to kill tumor cells. Oops, you're muted, I think, for a sec. Sorry, I was, I, that's a good point. I, I, I'm going to do a literature search and see what studies have been done and whether I can learn more about that. So when we use radiation, it's ionizing radiation. So it causes breakage of bonds within the DNA that, that then uh, the body has to repair. Um, and the question is, we're causing some damage to normal tissue. You want that to be repaired. The damage that you're intentionally causing to the, to the structures in the cells that leads to the cancer cell deaths you don't want to repair. What's the net effect of having a body that's ready to repair itself? Right. So um, Yes, we could go on and on about this yeah. for a whole hour, which maybe we'll have to do sometime. Um, and so, you know, what I tell patients is a high quality multivitamin that would contain antioxidants, including vitamins A, E, C, et cetera, is typically considered safe even during active cancer treatment. And again, we're going a little bit off script and off topic, but I think a lot of people have questions about that. Um, mm -hmm. it, I had a husband who passed away from cancer and one of the first things that he wanted to do as soon as he was diagnosed with cancer was suddenly start taking all these vitamins and things and people were recommending things like that to him and and in fact that was one of my motivations for studying integrative medicine because I didn't know it wasn't part of my conventional training to have the answers to that and so I'm very sensitive to that um, that sense that people often have as soon as they're diagnosed with cancer that they want to do everything they can. And in some cases, it may or may not be safe. And so I could not 
Uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of working with somebody who has some of this knowledge before just embarking on a supplement regimen if you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis and are in active cancer treatment. Yep, great point. So that being said, uh, in terms of sleep, I'll just, I don't wanna belabor these things and we wanna have time for questions, but um, there are certain vitamins and minerals that are particularly helpful in sleep and B vitamins are among them and magnesium is among them. And so if I were to recommend two things in the vitamin and mineral category that could be helpful for sleep, it's the B vitamins and magnesium. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna kind of um, zip through these slides because I don't want to belabor, belabor boring details. We want to have more of a conversation. Um, but B6, B12, folate, all of these are really, really important. And there are some studies that are finding how important they are. We know that the B vitamins are the building blocks for our neurotransmitters. So things like GABA and uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. And, um, and so we, we need to have enough B vitamins around to make those neurotransmitters that are so important for sleep, that are important for um, dealing with depression and anxiety and normal mental health. So we have to have those building blocks around to be able to create the neurotransmitters to be able to sleep properly. So it's, it's very basic at the most basic level that we would need these things. So again, a high quality multivitamin is really all that one would need or a person could find. I t uh, tend to draw blood levels of some of these uh, vitamins. And if someone is deficient or has insufficient levels, I can make um, recommendations accordingly for how much they might need. Uh, so again, I have just on here some information on B12 and B6 and how, and that some studies have found that they're specifically important in sleep. Um, and Suzanne, on the yeah. B12, mm -hmm. so, um, You've got the slide up, so you might be going to answer this. It isn't yeah. that it isn't that you take a B12 before you go to bed. No, thank you. Good point. Yeah, you're yeah. you're talking about just taking in it, general, because because sometimes you'll see the B12 are heavy doses of B12 are in some energy drinks that tend to give you a bit of a buzz. But right. you're just <laughs> saying that being deficient in the B. Yes. That's an excellent point. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that this isn't something that I would say just pop this before bedtime and it'll help you sleep. But but yes, not being deficient, having normal blood levels of B12 and B6 and folate and, and the other B vitamins is really important. And when I check my patients' blood levels, I find that many of us are very deficient in things. In fact, I did my own little experiment on my uh, own micronutrient levels a couple of years ago after a period of time where I decided I wasn't going to take any vitamins and things. And I found that I was very deficient in spite of having a diet that's very high in micronutrients, supposedly, and I eat lots of vegetables and fruits, and yet I was still deficient. So again, I think probably most of us could benefit from a high quality multivitamin that would include the recommended daily allowances of, of the B vitamins. So um, yeah, these are boring looking slides. Magnesium. I love magnesium. This is something I talk about till I'm blue in the face. We know that as a country, we are more deficient in magnesium than ever before. And it's based on some of our uh, agricultural practices and our food preparation practices. Things like whole grains are high in magnesium until the grain is stripped and turned into white bread, for example. So we lose a lot of the magnesium that we used to have. And it's estimated that, um, that Americans have about 50% of the uh, magnesium stores that we had a century ago. Um, and magnesium is really important for muscle relaxation. Um, I, I often think back to my biology classes um, in probably high school and college, and you might even remember yourself, this idea of these little actin and myosin cross bridges in the muscles. And when our muscles contract, these actin and myosin um, fibers ratchet up and then they get stuck together. And it's not until magnesium can enter the cell that those actin and myosin cross bridges can relax. And so uh, again, it's estimated that, estimated that we have much, much lower magnesium stores in our bodies than, than Americans did a hundred years ago. And it's tough because a blood test isn't gonna show it. 
because where muscle uh, magnesium lives in the body is in the muscles, it's in the brain, it's in the bones. And so I always tell my patients, we'd have to do a brain biopsy or a muscle or a bone biopsy to really accurately know how much magnesium you have. Your blood level is going to be normal because the body knows that it has to keep it normal in order to prevent us from having a fatal heart, uh, heart arrhythmia. So, um, so magne magnesium is super important, but the body prioritizes keeping it in the blood at the expense of our brain and muscle and bones. So most Americans could benefit from some magnesium in supplement form. And I have on the next slide the uh, recommended daily allowance. But we know that people, as long as they don't have any kidney dysfunction, can safely take up to 600 to 800 milligrams of magnesium per day. And that is way higher than most of us get through foods. So I see problems uh, ranging from muscle aches, things like restless leg syndrome even, a little magnesium goes a long way. Uh, anybody with a sleep problem or honestly any mental health problem probably would benefit from some magnesium. Uh, I have on the next slide, this is again, I'm not uh, advertising for natural calm. However, it is a really good way to get magnesium into the system. It's a powder that you mix with water and can drink in the evening as kind of part of your little bedtime routine if it turns out you like it. Um, but magnesium is one of those things that we probably all need a little bit more of or a lot more of in many cases. And it's something simple to do. Of course, you could take magnesium in tablet form. Magnesium does tend to cause loose stool. So don't go out and start a massive magnesium program without taking that into consideration or you will hate my gut. So I would not be doing my job if I didn't tell you to think about that. Yes, you probably uh, do not want to <laughs> supplement your magnesium with magnesium citrate or a milk of magnesium. <laughs> right. And the, just the names of those might remind you what they do and, and how this is true. Now, there is a form of magnesium called magnesium glycinate that, causes, that tends to cause less loose stool. So I often will tell people, you know, use your whatever forms of magnesium until you get to the point of having too much loose stool and then maybe add magnesium glycinate or try it if you are one of those people who just plain cannot tolerate magnesium because of the loose stool effect. So there, you've been warned. We probably need it, but be careful. Start slowly and titrate up. All right, we'll talk a little bit um, about some other natural sleep aids. Um, these are more in the plant-based or herbal botanical realm. Uh, actually, I guess the first one I have up is not, come to think of it. But anyway, some other su supplements that people might um, consider trying. And I have on here the just uh, mentioned that these are not going to knock you out, but they're, they're, they tend to have a gentler effect, but they do work very well, I am here to tell you. Melatonin is the first one I mentioned. Uh, melatonin is a, is a neurotransmitter that's made in the brain. We all make it. As we get older, it tends to, we tend to make less melatonin. Uh, we also know that bright lights suppress our melatonin from, uh, from rising appropriately, and even some medications can mess it up, uh, and things like alcohol and caffeine as well. So all of these different things are assaults on our melatonin system, and just the fact just aging contributes to lower melatonin rise. So it, a number of people take melatonin as a supplement. Um, I am one of the people who once upon a time tried it, didn't work. And I hear that all the time from patients that they've tried it, it doesn't work. What I have learned in my integrative medicine studies is that less is more when it comes to melatonin. Often people will take three to five milligram dosages, which are the common over-the-counter dose. And often that is just too much. And that doesn't, that type of dose doesn't correlate as well with the natural circadian rhythm as a lower dose. So people will find that if they take a lower dose, uh, somewhere down in the 0.25 to 0.5 or even one to two milligrams often will be just the right dose and even work better than the higher doses. Interestingly, melatonin has been associated um, with breast cancer. People with low melatonin um, have, have been associated with breast cancer. Even uh, night shift work has been associated with breast cancer. And so the thought is that melatonin might be helpful in that regard. 
So it's something that's very safe um, and definitely works very well. So one to two milligrams of melatonin is what I would recommend. Um, any thoughts or questions or comments on melatonin? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the other <laughs> yeah. ones you're going to mention. And, right. uh... So melatonin is great. And by the way, it, um, and again, if you're actively taking chemotherapy, um, these are things that should be discussed with your physician. Um, in general, though, the ones that I'm mentioning don't have interactions with each other. So I happen to be one of those people that if I'm really trying to get a good night of sleep, I might take my magnesium, I might take my melatonin, I might take my valerian and layer it on and it works. So valerian root is an herbal remedy that is very safe, non-addictive, uh, no dependence issues, no withdrawal. The thing about valerian root is it doesn't act right away necessarily. Whereas melatonin is something you could take in the early evening and, and know that it will work that night. Valerian is one that studies have found takes a couple of weeks to have its maximum effect. So it would be something that a person would take on a regular basis. Um, and I would recommend taking it in the evening. Um, and I have on here some dosing information. Anytime you're using herbal remedies, uh, you wanna use uh, reputable brands. I don't really wanna get into brands, uh, but, but not, not all brands are created equal. Um, people are welcome to reach out to me. I, I can't really give uh, medical advice via text, email, or social media. I will have to say, even when it comes to uh, herbal medicine, this is again why it's a really good idea to work with, um, with a practitioner who can even give recommendations for um, brands and things. Um, hops, hops, yep, hops is in beer. <laughs> um, but the plant hops is widely used in Europe for sleep. Um, hops is a um, natural plant-based estrogen also. So a lot of times women who are dealing with hot flashes and night sweats, which um, can worsen sleep, of course. And of course that also pertains sometimes to men dealing with prostate cancer on medications that uh, can mess with their hormones. Um, hops would be a, a plant-based estrogen. It's, it's safe, however, to take in my opinion, even if you're dealing with breast or prostate cancer, um, the combination of valerian and hops has been found to be effective. In fact, there was a study that looked at valerian, hops, and passion flower uh, and tested it against Ambien and found that that combination of valerian, hops, and passion flower was equivalent to Ambien after two weeks of use. So that's pretty cool. So there are a lot of proprietary blends of herbs that combine a number of these different things. So if you are looking at a bottle of some kind of herbal remedy and see that some of these different things are in it or a tea, I'm a huge fan of herbal tea. Uh, you might see some of these things, urban uh, uh, hops, herbal remedies, hops, valerian, passion flower, et cetera, and, and know that, hey, that's a, that's a great thing to use before bedtime. Um, L-theanine is the ingredient in green tea that is relaxing, and some might say, but I thought green tea had uh, caffeine in it, which it does, so I wouldn't recommend drinking green tea at bedtime, but the component of green tea called L-theanine can be separated out, taken in uh, supplement form, and has been found to be very helpful for sleep. Also, drinking green tea during the day is an excellent option because you're getting the antioxidant effects of the green tea during the morning, the, maybe the caffeine boost, and then you're still um, deriving the benefit of that L-theanine, which will help you that night. So one of those things, if you're going to use green tea as a sleep aid, though, drink it in the morning, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. Is that totally confusing? So. <laughs> No, I, no, I, I think it makes sense that it's these, uh, some of these um, supplements and nutrients being deficient causes the problem. And it's not that it makes you sleep, but having an adequate amount in the body is therapeutic. Absolutely. Yes. And we're running out of time. So I'm going to zip through some. Yeah. Passion flower is great. You'll find it in teas. You can buy it in, um, or in capsule form. Again, I just 
have this picture here to remind us that herbal teas are the way to go. I have this enormous tote of herbal tea in my pantry that I use for every ailment under the sun. And there are so many uh, teas that are on the market that will say things like nighty night or cup of calm or various sleep sleepy time kinds of names. Turn it over, look at the ingredients and you'll guaranteed see some of these that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it's a great, it's part of that evening ritual too. So it's just perfect to kind of have a cup of tea with some of these herbs that are helpful, maybe a warm bath, turn down your lights, turn off your computer, turn off your devices and sweet dreams. So we'll get summarizing here. Um, just wanted to recap a little bit that we know that REM sleep especially is so important and that there are so many different things that can affect our REM sleep, everything from our mind noise, the um, our medications that we take, things that we consume can mess with our REM sleep. Um, one of the easiest things to explore is whether we have a nutritional imbalance. Um, think B vitamins, think magnesium. They're very easy to get in a multivitamin or a little extra magnesium. And then maybe explore some of these natural sleep, sleep aids, even in something as simple as an herbal tea. I wanted to show this slide. Uh, these are two resources that I share with my patients very regularly. Uh, in fact, these are two of my teachers, um, Dr. Weil and Dr. Ruben Nyman uh, was my sleep teacher in my fellowship. Um, I worked with him regarding one of my personal sleep issues. Um, and they have this CD that is a two part CD that is everything you ever wanted to know about sleep. Um, and, and then the second CD are practices to help you fall asleep and stay asleep. It's excellent. It's also available to be downloaded. So something to look for. And then the book, Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker is absolutely fantastic. And it talks about everything you ever wanted to know about sleep and how it affects every organ system in the body and why it's so important. And it just belabors the fact that eight hours of sleep is what we need to be healthy. So it's an excellent book. Um, have a little slide of resources and that's boring and I will stop talking. And I'm sorry that we talked so long, but if anybody has any questions, I'm yeah, more than happy I to answer them. So I have one question, uh, yeah. one topic that we didn't get into. So we are in Iowa and we have uh, medical marijuana with uh, both THC and CBD. And that's available to individuals with certain um, uh, conditions and including yeah. cancer. So mm -hmm. this is done as a cancer education series. So yeah. most of the people that are watching uh, are probably eligible for uh, the the state of Iowa medical CBD and THC. So what about CBD and THC as sleep aids? Yeah, well, and I didn't include that, but absolutely, they're excellent sleep aids. And it's interesting because not too many years ago, we couldn't have a conversation at all on any medical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, period. Couldn't have a conversation in a hospital about medical marijuana, couldn't have a conversation anywhere about it. And unfortunately, the research um, in terms of everything about marijuana has not caught up with where a lot of us would like it to be. But, um, but I do know that it can be extremely helpful for people. And I think that we need to decriminalize it and, and understand that it has potent um, properties for sleep and anxiety and and all kinds of things. So have you had luck with your patients? You know, um, I have quite a few patients that are using it. Not enough that I can tell you in any scientific manner. Mm -hmm. And most of the patients that I have credentialed to be able to get get it, as you know, I don't prescribe it. I just mm -hmm. verify right. that, that someone has a condition by which the state um, then prescribes it. Um, and most of the patients that I have done it or taking it uh, to help with either symptoms of cancer or side effects of cancer treatment. Right. But definitely uh, sleep is one of them. Absolutely. And um, my experience is that um, um, Farm Med does a really good job of interviewing patients and determining, you know, what is the symptom that you're wanting to treat and what's the balance yes. between the THC and the CBD that might be best yeah. for, you know, sleep versus pain versus anxiety versus neuropathy, et cetera. Right. 
Yeah, I've I've had conversations with their biochemist. Uh, they they do an extremely good job with that. So absolutely, I think it's it's great that we're making tiny strides toward having that available in this state. Um, but yes, if you can if you can make that happen and and want to explore it, I I would condone that. <laughs> You know, uh, Chris has been looking at the Q&A. Chris, are there yeah, there's any a, questions? There are a couple of questions. One is, uh, does the tea need to be warm to be most effective, or can you cool down chamomile tea and still get the same benefits? Absolutely. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned chamomile. It's way up on my list of great <laughs> sleepy time teas, and I didn't mention it in here. Um, but yes, you can drink your tea hot or cold, however you prefer, however okay. you prefer it. That's good. What about yes, chamomile being, is a great one. What about being tired during the day is another question. What can what can be done if I feel tired during the day? Well, I think tired during the day is probably a, a symptom of inadequate sleep uh, or lack of quality sleep. So I think all of the things that we talked about this evening are things to consider or try or experiment with. Um, and, and just see if, if and I'm a, I'm a proponent of, of trying to do kind of some journaling of symptoms. So, so notice what you, how you feel at baseline, um, how your day is, what your sleep is like, and then maybe try some of these interventions. You can try them all at once if you want the kitchen sink approach, or you can try them one at a time and see, see what does what, um, or try them all and then start, um, removing one of them or something and see how it goes. But, uh, but yeah, it, it has been found that daytime sleepiness is a symptom of inadequate sleep or, or poor quality sleep. So you may not be getting that REM sleep. And so ask yourself if you're dreaming, um, ask yourself if there's a medication or, or too much caffeine or alcohol or any of those things we talked about that might be contributing and just see what happens if you pare them down. Uh, and frankly, alcohol is probably one of the biggest culprits that I see when I'm talking with patients who think that it isn't affecting them. And I'll often say, try a night with none or a week with no alcohol or, or some amount of time and just notice how your sleep compares. Because I really do think it's one of the biggest culprits of poor sleep. Um, we know that alcohol use has skyrocketed, especially during the past year during the pandemic. Um, uh, we, we do know that alcohol is is very heavily used. And I think we've normalized it um, to the point that we don't really realize possibly how much of an effect it has. Um, and so that's something I really encourage people to experiment with a little bit is cutting that out and just seeing. And you might find that it's worth it. I personally have found that uh, very little alcohol affects my sleep to enormous extents. And um, it, I've experimented with it and discovered that, wow, when I cut that out and have essentially cut it out, um, my sleep is markedly better. And for me, it's a quality of life improvement that's worth it. Well, Suzanne, this, I can't believe the hour has gone by so quickly. <laughs> yeah. This has been great. I've learned a lot. I really appreciate uh, your, your willingness to uh, share with, uh, with us your, your knowledge and to have a conversation about it. And I look forward to having you back and uh, having some conversations about some of the other topics oh, yeah. that, uh, that you are um, expert on. I, the floor, forest bathing book there, I <laughs> highly recommend that. We'll have you back and talk a bit about forest bathing and uh, um, what we can do by being out in nature and just soaking it in. I know it. We had planned a forest bathing outing with Above and Beyond oh, Cancer yeah, for last right. summer. And gee, what happened to that and what everything happened? else yeah. for the full year? <laughs> so we'll make that happen one of these days. And oh, that'll be fun. Well, hopefully we didn't put everybody to sleep or hopefully <laughs> we did. Right. <laughs> this has been great. So Chris, we're going to turn it back over to you to send us out. Yeah, the, these uh, sessions are recorded. This was a, a perfect example of information that we'd love to share, uh, both on our YouTube channel uh, with our Above and Beyond Cancer, but also on the Mercy One uh, Cancer Center website. Uh, there's, a, there's a cancer education series page where all these are documented, and uh, it's a wonderful resource, and we hope you use it. So otherwise, we'll see you again next week. 